Welcome back to Civil Wars, I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on why the Iraqi insurgency began. Let's start off with what the situation on the ground was like before the 2003 war. So during Saddam's era as the dictator of Iraq, you had what was a functionally a minority rule in the country. So the country breakdown, the population breakdown is 63% Shia Muslim, 34% Sunni Muslim, and a very few 3% others. So basically, you have two groups in the country, a Shia majority and a Sunni minority. However, Saddam was Sunni. And so if you were a Sunni in Iraq, you were living a relatively good life where you were able to fill the government positions, you were able to get top jobs, whereas if you were a Shia, those sorts of opportunities just weren't available to you. Now, while this was horribly unfair from a sense of distributive justice, it actually makes sense given the balance of power in the country. Saddam's regime held virtually all of the power, and because he had all of the power and he wasn't exactly a nice person, he was able to brutally repress the other side. And this was a stable distribution. Remember, a stable distribution is a distribution of benefits that matches the distribution of power within the country. That's what we learned about the bargaining regime. Range, right? The bargaining range is located centrally around the distribution of power. So in a place where you have all the power, that means if you're a jerk, you're capable of keeping all of the benefits to yourself. And that's what we saw in Iraq. He actually, Saddam Hussein, actually institutionalized this unfair distribution of benefits with the Ba'ath Party. So the Ba'ath Party was a political party that essentially created a one-party system within the country. So if you were anyone of consequence, you had to be a member of this Ba'ath Party. So if you were a civil servant, you had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party. If you held a government position, you had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party. If you were in the military, you had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party. If you were an educator, you had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party. If you were were a doctor or a nurse, you had to be a member of the Bath Party. And heck, if you were a member of the National Olympic Committee, you had to be a member of the Bath Party. And this actually extended to most college students too. So if you were someone who was trying to get an education, you had to be a member of the Bath Party. Bath Party is where all of the benefits are. If you're not a member of the Bath Party, good luck getting a good job. So this is actually so extreme that I myself, if I had been in Iraq, there's a very good chance that I would have been a member of the Ba'ath Party, right? Because I'm a PhD candidate. The only way I could ascend to that sort of level of education would be to have joined the Ba'ath Party. So I might have been inclined to join the Ba'ath Party, not because I wanted to be Saddam Hussein's best buddy for life, but rather because I wanted to have a good job and because this is what I'm good at. So to be able to do what I'm good at, I would have had to have joined the Ba'ath Party. Well, fast forward a few years, and in March 2003, the United States invades Iraq, kicks butt, and topples the Saddam regime. So by December 2003, we eventually find where Saddam was hiding, and he is executed afterward. Basically, Saddam is gone, the United States takes over, and the United States dictates how Iraq will be rebuilt. During this time, you have many soldiers ignoring orders and going home. So I want to point out here that these soldiers weren't loyal to Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party. As soon as they saw that the United States was invading, they realized that they were going to lose. And just like in 1991, they'd probably lose very badly. So you saw a lot of divisions of soldiers saying, to heck with this, we're not going to be fighting a war that we're not going to win for a guy that we don't particularly like. And they just went home. Now, the way that the Bush administration, and in fact, George W. Bush himself, celebrates this and commemorates this is by flying into an air or flying onto and landing on an aircraft carrier with this mission accomplished banner in the background. So he flies in on a fighter jet in the full garb and then gives a speech about, you know, good job, we won the war, etc. This is a moment that now lives in infamy because, as we all know, the mission wasn't exactly accomplished in 2003. 2003 didn't really mark the end of the war overall. It marked the end of the first phase of the war, the interstate war between the United States and Saddam Hussein. Of course, what happens thereafter for the next 10 years is a civil war where the United States and elements of Iraq that we want to work with try to fight and stop a civil war and uprising against elements that the Iraqis that we're siding with in the United States do not like. 
So to recap here, with only a little bit of hyperbole, everyone who was well-educated, everyone who knew how to run the government, and everyone with a gun was a member of the Ba'ath Party. And these facts have to do with why in 2003, when Bush landed on the aircraft carrier, we didn't actually see mission accomplished. You can only guess what happens next, and you would guess actually correctly if you did the very obvious guess, or you made the obvious guess. So the United States implements what we call debathification. So when we say uh, Iraq is going to be debathified, what we mean by this is that all members of the Ba'ath Party were fired from their positions and they were banned from being rehired. So this debathification was actually trying to get rid of all elements of the Ba'ath Party that existed within the country. The plan internally from Washington was to take all of these job openings and fill them with exiled Iraqis, people who really didn't like Saddam Hussein and actually left the country to avoid his repression, and dissidents internally. Unfortunately, this wasn't exactly the smartest idea. Let's do a quick little role play here. Imagine that you were a professor with a university-owned computer. You learned that you're going to be fired and that you will never, ever be able to get your job back. What are you going to do? Well, you're probably going to st uh, steal that university-owned computer and probably steal whatever else of value that you can get your hands on. Similarly, imagine that you were a central banker with access to cash reserves in Iraq, and you learned because you had that position you were a Ba'ath Party member, and because you're a Ba'ath Party member, you're going to be fired, and you're never, ever going to be able to get your job back. What are you going to do? Well, you're probably going to be stealing as much cash as you possibly can, and anything else with value. And perhaps even worse, imagine that you're a soldier with guns and tactical knowledge. You have a very particular set of skills, and you know how to use them. So you are fired, you're a member of the Bath Party because you're a soldier, and you learn that you're never going to be hired back either. What are you going to do? Well, if you think about the distribution of benefits in the country at the time, we had instituted a democracy within the country. Who does democracy favor? Whom does democracy not favor? Well, democracies tend to favor majorities. And Iraq, remember, was 63% Shia Muslim, only 34% Sunni Muslim. And remember that when Saddam Hussein was in power, it was the Sunnis who were getting all of the benefits, and they were the ones with the guns. The soldiers were Sunnis and members of the Ba'ath Party. So... If you are a Shia, you have a lot of political power. If you're a Sunni, you don't have a lot of political power, which means you can't be expecting to get a lot of benefits from the incoming regime, the new government, but you do have a lot of guns. And to make matters even worser, at the time, Iraq was in the middle of the stage of rebuilding. The Saddam Hussein regime wasn't exactly good at developing the economy, but as the war started and ended, you had a vacuum of power where there wasn't very much control over the country, a lot of looting, a lot of destruction. And on top of that, you had the people who were the most capable and the most competent at fixing these problems. I'm talking about your police force, your civil servants, your military. All of them are now unemployed. So you have inefficiency abound, you don't have good opportunities for anyone in the country, and particularly those who have the guns. And as a result, insurgency breaks out. People with the guns who are not expecting to get benefits from the new regime say, to heck with this, this doesn't benefit us, but we do have military power, so we're going to use it. Eventually, the Bush administration revises the debathification party, uh, de sorry, debathification policy, but this is a little bit too late in the game to do much good. So the too long didn't read here is that debathification ran contrary to everything we know about bargaining theory. Bargaining theory, as we saw a couple of lectures ago, says that if you want a stable distribution of goods, you need to make sure that those goods match the underlying military power within your region. Unfortunately, the military power favored the minority Sunnis who had been in charge of the government before the United States toppled the Saddam Hussein regime. And these guys had all of the power, but they weren't getting very many of the benefits. And because of this, the United States pays the price for the next 10 plus years in Iraq. Now, there are three different ways of looking at this. You might be thinking to yourself, is this the Bush administration's fault? And depending upon how kind you want to be and sympathetic you want to be to the Bush administration, you could look at this uh, in one of three different ways. The least kind interpretation of this is that the administration just completely failed to anticipate the consequences of debathification. They actually didn't really realize that this ran contrary to everything we know about bargaining theory, and so they really messed up. 
The second interpretation, which is a little bit kinder, is that, yes, the administration did fail to anticipate the consequences of debathification, but this was more of a result of the Bush administration focused on winning the first half of the war, the actual invasion, and spending less time trying to figure out how to properly handle the second half. So perhaps it might be the case that it was actually optimal for the Bush administration to figure out at the time how to win the war and then make everything else a secondary concern. As it turns out, that didn't really work out so well. The most favorable and most sympathetic interpretation of this, if you're a member of the Bush administration, is that the Bush administration actually made a rational gamble, that the Bush administration believed that United States military power would be able to implement the debathification policy despite the obstacles that we discussed here, and they just guessed wrong. So this actually is going to give us a good jumping point here. In the next few lectures, we're going to be discussing what happens when there is uncertainty about an outcome, where you, as the guy who's trying to make the offer, aren't sure how strong the other side is. Perhaps you think the other side is weak and you're going to be able to crush them. Perhaps you th might think that the other side is strong and you won't be able to crush them as well, or as much as you would be able to if the other side was weak. How do you work with this sort of trade-off where you're not really sure about how much to offer the other side because the other side may be powerful or may not be powerful. And you can see how this might relate to this third bullet point here where the Bush administration is gambling, thinking that they could control the counterinsurgency or could control the insurgency, but ended up not being able to control the insurgency. So that's where we're going to pick up next time. Hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time. Take care.